Hi, I'm Isander. I'm Coda. And today we're covering the Ninth Legion, which is one of the easiest to understand from the jump. You're going to get their shtick pretty much comprehensibly by the time we're done here. You look at Um, them and you get their shtick. They are space vampires. Uh, They're super gothic in their... I mean... Anything in the Imperium is going to be gothic. That's that's just their whole thing. But they are particularly gothic. And um, one of their key traits that defines them today is how haunted they are. On several levels, we're going we're gonna to unpack slowly. But they are just deeply, unimaginably haunted. Today is going to be a Blood Angels therapy session. Uh, kind of, honestly. They're not the only ones who are haunted, however. Uh, the Ultramarines have been stuffed into the loser's bracket, which I'm perfectly fine with. They're there with the Night Lords and the Inquisition. They'll come into play later. This is all part of my 30-step plan. Don't worry. I have a plan. If somebody regardless, says 30-step plan, never listen to them. Regardless, you get to choose the options this time, my friends, and they are the biggest orcs. It's probably going to be a Gaz episode, but we'll, we'll see if I can fit some of the Beast in there and some of the other... There's quite a few large orcs, and I mean that literally. <laughs> like it, in other factions, their named characters are usually like, "Oh, you can tell he's cool because he's named." But with the orcs, you can look at them and go, "That one's six five. He's important." That's just how it works. The other options are the named Necrons, which Trazen may steal that entire episode. If so, there will be others for named Necrons on brand for him. It, yeah, exactly. Um, the heroes of the Imperium, like Kaifus Kane and the others, basically the people who rose from nothing to something in a universe that's trying very hard to grind them into a fine mist. Um, that one should be a fairly interesting one. And then the last one are the Harlequins, because I'll be honest, if I put them up against any faction in earnest, they would get. Dusted. The poor Harlequin. There are so many things that have more named characters than there are Harlequin models. I'm hoping you guys find the grace in your hearts to not put another layer of clown makeup on them. That's all I'm asking. See, when we talk about the clown makeup on them, we're not talking about them. We're talking about the people who play them, unfortunately. Which is a shame. They're really, really cool, actually. They have a very specific thing they do, and they do it really well. It's just... They seem to be one of those things that's been forgotten. Don't they? F- like, th- their entire shtick is, like, futzing around in the webway and just, like, being trolls in general. That's That'll, ha- that'll come up on their episode. Today's about the Blood Angels. Uh, the winners, speaking of which, don't, unlike the clowns, don't need any makeup. This is a real and important fact that will come up later. They are all, and I mean all, weirdly hot. This is important. It will come up on the test. Remember that. Um, We do have to go back to the beginning, though, to understand why that matters. And the way these things usually work, like all the legions, is before they find their dad, they're usually working under Grandpa, the Emperor, doing any of his many, many, many crusades. The guy fought everyone at some point. He had a lot of problems he had to fix, and... Sending really tall men armed to the teeth is a very good way to fix problems sometimes. So, during this time, like all the other legions, they were shadow... Not quite shadows of their future selves, but a lot of the time they operate like sleeper agents almost, where they're, they're, they're soldiers. They're very clearly augmented, very effective soldiers who have some of the traits that they're going to have later, but... They really come into them themselves when they meet their their Primarch or their dad, right? Until then, they're usually... You can see glimmers of it here and there, but it's not... The painting's not finished yet. Of all the legions at this time, they quite possibly had it the worst, or at least they were up there, because they were sent to fight side by side with the Iron Warriors, they were, which we had two episodes on them. You can go watch them. They're amazing. The long and short of it is they would get the worst jobs every time, bar none, and you can't say no to the Emperor because there are two other legions that just vanished. So you can't, you don't, you just say yes, sir, and you make it happen. Well, vanished. I've heard one of them is still kicking around. Some would say. Some would say. And in these situations, whereas the Iron Warriors would kind of get ground into these brutal sieges that nobody enjoyed to be a part of, the Blood Angels would be sent almost like a hurricane in a direction. There would be this fury that the Emperor could direct at anything he wanted gone. 
re- like glassed effectively. He didn't want to speak to them. He didn't want to see them. He wanted just. It was like they were never there. They're just okay. So the landscapers, they made sure to just flatten the land. It, yes, and they <laughs> excelled at it to a disturbing degree because not only would they march forward and grind everything into a fine dust they would then turn around and eat what was left behind and waste no part of the bison all that jazz. waste not want not yeah exactly uh nobody was listen they're doing their jobs don't get me wrong but nobody was thrilled about this per se it it's the equ- it's the equivalent of inviting a vet over. You know, it's that unfortunate time. You have to say goodbye to Fido. You know, give him his b- best breakfast. The vet comes over. He walks out the door. You shut it. And then you hear a really loud, wet thwack against your house. And it's like, yeah, you did what I wanted you to do. That's one way to accomplish that. But why'd you do it in the most visceral way? Plot twist. You walk outside and it's the dog who's actually put the vet down. That would be quite the... This is the last shot you give me, god damn it! Great, great lord of Sith, or great gray wolf of Swift style. Kind of a situation, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the the levels of mess that the Blood Angels at the time would leave behind. They chose the most visceral route every single time, which is why people gave them the nickname of the Revenant Legion. Yeah. To be fair... Really cool name. Really cool name. Really cool name. But it made them zero friends. And eventually, because like most people, firing is hard and awkward. Nobody wants to fire anybody. So they just sent them on worse and worse missions, hoping they won't come back. They just kept getting sent on these missions that you should not come back from at all. This is a very particularly tough enemy. And... They even stopped giving them proper gear at a a certain point. And they still kept coming back every single time, just grinning with red in their mouths. And you're like, ah, (laughs) why, why, why would you? It's just every single time they'd come back, bright red grin and a standing puddle around them. And you're like, "Mm." oh, wash off. It, it, It got worse and worse, and they'd keep coming back every time. The Imperium's holding back more and more gear, because they are advancing at this time. They, they are discovering new things, they're improving armor, they're improving weapons, and the Revenants are not getting any of it, because y- you're concerning. <laughs> you are concerning. It got so bad that they would be deployed with other legions, and the, the other legions would see what they've done and go, burn the planet. Leave no record of this. Charge the whole thing to the game. What have we done? No, charge the whole thing to the game. Nobody can know that there's even a faction of us that's this brutal. This is where that e-boy gene comes back. I told you, it's going to be important on the quiz. <laughs> like I said, they are obscenely hot. This is this is a known trait. It's not like a self-insert situation. This isn't an author Well. Who, no, actually, no, 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 no. Let me finish. It's not an author who's just like writing them to write them that way just because he wants to and names them. No, no, no. There's a, it's a weird known quirk in the blueprint they use to create new Marines that results in being able to take anyone, even people who are so deformed you couldn't confuse them for a human if you tried. And if they pass the tests and pass the process to become a space Marine, they come out smoking hot. Every single time. It's said, there's another legion called the Space Wolves, and they are very, they get called the furries, basically. They're very canine in nature. They have really sharp teeth, really long hair. I think they howl, too. They say awu. Not like that. <laughs> Not like that at all. But and, and they even have these things called the wolfen, which are even more mutated. Like it, 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 the, Their process is known to be very different and m- almost unholy in how they do it it's seen as you're 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 twisting a person beyond even what a person should be and it's been hinted that the blood whatever the blood angels do is somehow more twisted than that Mm. but they come out hot every time so nobody cares it it, it's (laughs) it's 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 the ultimate um you could pick any single blood angel today Give them a phone and TikTok, 
and they'd make a killing doing the bare minimum. I'm talking lip syncing on their couch with a wink. And they'd be raking in dough. Uh, no, you'd just have a bunch of you'd have a bunch of blood angels doing the AI like uh, NPC trend. Yeah, and they'd be making a killing out of it. They it, it it would be jarring to see, but that's how hot they are. Which, as an aside, I find it infinitely funny that we live in a time. I'm not gonna say we're taking this for granted, but you can know today if you're hot or not. There's no debate. There's no longer the, oh, I'm a Hoboken 10, but I'm a Miami 2. It's, no, we can we can settle this right now. You're an internet 3. <laughs> yeah, we can settle this right now. If you can make a killing on the internet doing nothing at all, you're, you're hot. To be fair, the internet's very skewed when it comes to standards. Well, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of unfair because the internet, to succeed on the internet, you have to be basically the top, I'd say, third, third of people. And you're good at something. Either you're like freakishly hot, freakishly buff, freakishly charismatic. There's no normal people who... Well, actually, sometimes some slip through the cracks. But for the most part, it's you're seeing the best of the best. And we're seeing now generation after generation being raised, looking at that and going, Oh, that's normal. That's normal. That's what normal is supposed to look like. And that's like. not what normal looks like. Normal, if you judge normal based on the internet, you will think every guy should be shredded. Beyond belief, or Germa, or or, or Germa, <laughs> and again, no top thirty percent, genuinely, infinitely funny guy, infinitely. Fun. Do you know how hard it is to entertain people for as long as he's done consistently? That's at a certain point, you, it's skill. It's obviously skill, right? And so it's it's we're getting into the weeds here. Maybe I'm going to start a channel to rant about this kind of stuff more often. But it, I think it's part of why people feel so genuinely disaffected at times because it feels like there are two rule books and there's rule book a whether you're either hot smart charismatic any of those things i mentioned or lucky because sometimes lucky plays into it right and if you get that rule book fantastic you are now in your home making some people's yearly wage in a month and then there's rule book number two which is clock in and the difference between those books is getting wider and wider every day, man. You have the GM toolkit and the player handbook. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels so truly unfair. I think it's why nowadays you see like celebrities getting more and more crap just for being celebrities per se. Whereas before, a few years ago, they were worshipped. I, I don't know, maybe it's just like my corner of the internet, but... I see a lot of people specifically angry against like the celebrities and the elites who have it all while... I can't pay for rent. Like how how did you accomplish this? And it was just it was one of those three the one of those things I mentioned. There are two rule books. And some people get rule book A, some people get rule book B. You That's leaked, about it. You leaked a really, really bad sex tape and now you have a TV show. If I did that, it'd be a crime. <laughs> I have so many things to say, but that will derail this whole episode. I have so many things to say. Oh, that will be an episode on a separate channel or its own someday. I don't know. <laughs> rant, rant channel coming soon, basically. But what, what matters today is they can take a leper and make them into a person who gets rulebook A. Over, well, not overnight. They stuff them in a coffin for a year, but effectively overnight. Full on vampire and stuff. And that is why you could send them into Chernobyl and they'd... They'd clean the place up every single time with more people than you sent in and a suspicious lack of wildlife afterwards. Th that's the kind of people that they were, meaning you can't really shaft them by putting them in dangerous situations or by giving them worse gear, which is when the emperor decides to take the more direct approach and the revenant fleet were this close to being redacted. I'm talking... Like, the sword is right up in the air. Their necks are laid down there. They were this close to just being redacted like the rest of them. But right in the nick of time, Sang Sanguinius arrived. And this is not an episode on him. That will come later. But he's, he's obviously important because he's their dad. He's their blueprint, effectively. So we do need to cover him because he... 
guides the arc of the blood angels in a way. You can't separate the two. And usually when they arrive, they're a distillation of everything the Legion could be. It's like their full potential. It's whatever they're best at taken to its logical extreme. And so Sangi wasn't just strikingly hot. No, he had massive angelic wings and he was rubbing up against almost divinity levels of being hot. He was literally an angel. It, it was so hot, people would worship him out of it. It's that degree. I'm talking long flowing hair, bright shining armor, body of Arnold in his prime and the speed and agility of a gymnast. He could do no wrong. He was that guy. It, he, he, it, if you look at a family portrait of the emperor and his kids, Two people will stick out basically immediately. The Emperor and Sanguinius. You can just, you can see them in every lineup every single time because they just reek of divinity. And that is his biggest strength. He, when he met the Emperor, he immediately fell to his knees, said, oh, you're my dad. Because, I mean, so, some fought him. Some, divinity recognizes yeah, divinity. Yeah, but he was one of those where game recognized game kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And he immediately fell to one knee and just asked, hey, please, these guys worship me. Don't stomp them into the ground over it, please. Please. And he wept tears that shone like crystals and sprouted flowers everywhere they landed. I'm not joking. That's... I, I'm not joking when I say he could do no wrong. That has to be like a Creative Liberty-like le legend there. That's, a, that's one of the few things that's recorded well. That's huh. a known thing. The place where he landed became known as Angel's Fall and is like a mecca now. Huh. You could see it from the beginning. You you just knew he was different. And it was kind of odd that his legion were the guys who turn everything into mist. Actual cannibal. Actual cannibal. Blood angels. Yeah. And so when they met, there was actually a bit of, a bit of tension in the air because... You have all the. And it did take a while to gather all the blood angels because they were sent on every bad mission across the galaxy. Kinda so it took need a while. To recall them and then send the Iron Warriors to take their places. <laughs> that's, that's actually what happened, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much verbatim. And so you have this yard full of people who are strikingly hot still, but scarred bloody they're smiling itching waiting for the next fight and then you have sanguinius literally descending from the sky with pillars of light backing him and you could just tell this was not going to gel properly especially since the usual thing that most legions do is they swear loyalty to their father but when sanguinius landed the first thing he did was actually do the opposite he swore loyalty to them he said i'll serve you for as long as you'll let me and that immediately won them over. And from there on, he proceeded to learn all their names. Sanguinius was a kind of boss where he works in New York. You work in, let's say, Miami. And he knows the names of everyone in the office when he walks in. And asks them personal details. And you're like, I don't know. I mentioned that once two years ago. How do you, How do you remember that? He, was that? he was that caliber of boss. The best kind of boss, effectively. And... It's really funny when you think about that's how the blood that's how the blood angels met their dad, and then the iron warriors met their dad with Perturabo looking at them going, eh, "You're all weenies. Kill one in ten of you. I'll be back later." <laughs> and that was it. That was that was that was all of it. There was no hi. I'm Perturabo. It's nice to meet you. It's you look soft. Let's fix that. Round decimate off. yourselves. Yeah, decimate. you should decimate yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> that's how Perturabo led. <laughs> He's such a bad manager. <laughs> Meanwhile, you have Sanguinius, who just is a, a different kind of manager, which worked way better. Under his reign, the first thing he did was not just start barking orders at them and telling them, do this, do that, do that. Again, I love doing the Blood Angels right after the Iron Warriors. because It's you can, such a great you can juxtaposition. You the jarring difference between the two. He instead observed. He, he let them continue being the animals they were for a little bit. And just watched how they did things. And in this, he saw a reflection of the fury that he has himself. Hold on. See, Sanguinius is the kind of guy who, from a distance, looks really well put together. I mean, really well put together. But 
You don't want to see him angry under any circumstance at all. The fury that I described the Blood Angels having, that fury that earned them the name of the Revenant, he had that to an entirely different degree. He was almost never mad, but you don't want him mad. He's said to have reached greater levels of fury than his brother Angron, who, no prizes for guessing what his whole shtick was, but he had chunks of his brain removed so he could feel more anger. Again, not, not willingly, though. It, it did happen to him against his will. But regardless, he was very angry. He's a man quite literally wired for fury, and it's said that Sanguinius could reach higher highs than that. Impressive, he was, I think. The difference between the two is he was, well, also, I'll give I'll give Angron some credit. Again, he had parts of his brain removed. Sanguinius never did. So that, that helps restrain things. But he was just phenomenal at controlling his fury and helped guide his sons towards doing the same. The first thing he did is he would only send blood angels with other legions that he thought fought honorably. So that they could observe. So they'd have this jarring difference of people engaging in 1v1s while well, that guy bit that guy's head off. Eventually, And then he continued to eat the rest of him. Eventually it rubbed off. And then from there, he started taking that same furious energy that still existed. It, it doesn't go anywhere. It's still there. And he started directing it towards different pursuits, um, which remains to be a, a big part of their culture today, actually. The Blood Angels on their downtime, more than some of the other legions, will take up painting, sculpting, forging, really any hobby that lets them create things, they will do on their off time, using that to focus that same energy that made them a hurricane on the field into these works that are Michelangelo and higher, basically, with the guiding ethos that... A victory rings fairly hollow if you can't appreciate the beauty of what you're saving. And so that's what they try to do. That's what they try to emulate. They're very meticulous in what they do. They're very honorable in combat. They will sit down and make these wonderful, gorgeous pieces of art and focus hours of their long lives into it so that they can really appreciate what they're putting their lives on the line for. They try more than... Every other legion, I would say, to breathe and take in the moment as the unique and irreplaceable gift that it is. This moment right now that you're experiencing will never happen again. It will come and it will go when the credits roll for this episode. And they just strive to enjoy it for what it is. They don't dread its passing. They're just grateful that it happened. He taught them mindfulness. Yeah. It's neat. It's, it's you know, for, for a man, for a universe with a man named Angron running around on planets named Murder, <laughs> it's an oddly poignant and solid goal to aspire to. 40K has its moments. So I like it. Very good. I, I, again, I just love the juxtaposition of Angron, Murder, the planet, mm -hmm. and then, oh, yeah, mindfulness. Uh, there was actually... My favorite thing about Murder of the Planet is there was the war on murder, which sounds like something that policymakers would take the on. The war on murder. Yeah, the war on murder, but it's a real thing. Um, they would also try to bring in worlds first peacefully, too, instead of just bringing down their full fury down on it. It would be like, hey, please join us. Want to do peace? Don't test me, please. We will eat you. Mm, they, they stopped that, too. Oh, well. they, they stopped that too. Never mind. We'll be tempted to eat you. Yeah. And when they weren't doing that, they would, spe when they weren't doing that, or when they weren't crafting, they'd get roped into these, what can only be described as fetch quests, where they will derail everything they're doing to go to a single planet and slay a vicious demon, saving a town in the process, but mostly because he was guarding this one gorgeous hydrangea that I just it pulled the room together and I, I needed that they, they would they would fight the most grueling wars imaginable slowly and methodically just to capture a planet because it has a specific mineral they can grind into this beautiful sh shade of red and it's gonna fit my wings so well 
it, it makes them happy. I can't even be mad at them. It genuinely makes them happy. I mean, fair enough. It's it's what they like to do. Fair enough. He, that guy's into woodworking. So yes, he went and took over the planet with the best trees because he really likes it. And now he's been doing this for the last 500 years. And it's just a thing he does. A lot of Blood Angel stuff you'll see is super ornate. It's super well made. And it's all crafted by their hands. It's not... Uh, and they have this reputation for being all pomp and circumstance. But in every piece of over, over-sculpted art or gaudy design or room that looks like it belongs in The Dictator 2... It's a reflection of them just trying their best to hold it all together. It made a blood angel at some point really happy to sculpt that. And so he did. The, as far as the legions go, that's really, that's a good reason. Coming from a space marine, yeah. Yeah, that's Because most other space marines are just like, ah, yes, purge. purge uh, purging makes me happy. <laughs> and the blood angels are just like, you know, I painted a really nice painting once. Dad's got it on his fridge. Yeah. And Sanguinius really would. If he really liked it, which, I mean, if you showed it to him and he liked it, he would definitely bring it in. Like, he was that guy. If he owned a refrigerator, he would mag- He would stick it to the refrigerator he with magnets. He definitely owns a refrigerator because they do store and drink blood. Aha. So he, he, he does definitely own a fridge. It's rather large. So there's a blood refrigerator somewhere in the Blood Angels, like, inner sanctum that's yeah. just covered in, like, watercolor paintings. That are gorgeous, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't help but love these guys. They're great. How can you be mad at them? Especially when you compare them to some of their other brothers who, at their worst, don't even enjoy ripping and tearing through the enemy. They just go, this is something I need to do. And they just do it joylessly. I don't know why they keep on living, frankly. They just do what they're told to every single time and never take any time off. Just like, I am a tool. I know that, I think. And there's no existential dread about it. They've just accepted it. Just like I'm a tool. Yeah, I, 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 I won't lie. Researching this episode, it, they, 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 they climbed up. They shot up the ranks for me. Okay, to be fair, I already kind of like them. As soon as you told me they were art freaks, I'm like, okay, that's neat. And they also have some really good books. But anyway, speaking of some grueling wars, we're currently on the mission to 100k on YouTube, and the only way that happens is together. All you have to do is like, subscribe, and share the video with one other person who you think will either like it or would be a fan of the Blood Boys. And that's it. That's the fastest way we can get to it. It's the only language that our all-powerful machine gods speak. So please help us reach this goal together and help us continue producing the show. Speaking of which, if you want more of what you already like, we actually upload two episodes every week. This week was for uh, Sanguin- the Sanguinor and the two other angels that float around in the Blood Angels. Sangi's angels. Yeah. And uh, if you want to see that or any of the other projects we've done on the Death Corps of Krieg, Sigismund, the list goes on and on. Head on over to patreon.com slash Isander and Coda. You also get priority voting. So you help. It's kind of like a swing state is the way I think about it. The patrons votes count for more because there are less of them. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like. I think I was a swing state. One of them. I think, yeah, it's it's, it's like, uh, you're, congratulations, you've moved to Iowa, basically. Maine? And is Maine you, a swing state? No, definitely not. No? And on top of that, for those of you outside the U.S., that makes no sense, so we're just going to keep it pushing. <laughs> and you also get access to the community Discord, which is always really good fun. So we look forward to seeing you on there, and thank you for those of you that are already there. Thank you for those of you signing up as I speak. This time period for the Blood Angels was probably the best time you could ever be a blood angel it, things things were going they, they had dad he was putting his paintings up on the fridge we were having community art classes it was, it was a great good it was it pretty was, good this is a great time this is a great time but you know the tagline for 40k nothing good ever lasts it's it, it, it it's not it's the grim darkness of the yeah. 41st millennium and despite their best efforts to keep this fury in check it would come back with a vengeance when they watched countless, I'm talking thousands of blood angels, get slaughtered during one particularly harrowing fight that ended with Sanguinius getting both his legs broken and thrown around like he's Loki in the original Avengers. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a pretty rough fight. It was, it was, oh. They stuck him in the femur breaker? One demon did, yeah. Oh. This demon and the blood angels keep going back and forth, by the way. It's a whole thing, but yeah. Yeah. And the whole time, Korn is shouting, 
join me. The, the whole fight. Please. Yeah. You can have... I, I'm the blood guy. Please. I'll let you eat people again. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> when when they saw their father brought that low, that many of their brothers cut down with corn just whispering in all their ears for the entire fight, effectively. That fury came back with a vengeance, and it's the first time we would see it in the form that continues to haunt them to this day, known as the Red Thirst. It is... The Red Thirst is basically a full return to form back of their Revenant days. Um, they start eating corpses again, they take the most brutal option available every single time, and they can even turn on friends if there's not enough enemies left over. It's... It, they're full boar berserkers, basically. It's not great. I, I, but the, 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 the nice thing about this one is it can wear off. It, it will eventually drive you mad, and they will inter you into this tower, effectively. To just like, it's basically an asylum for them. It will eventually drive you crazy, but it's possible to ride out the red thirst, which is really good. And it's very different from the other flaw that they're going to get later, we'll touch on. But what this basically did is show everyone there, including Sanguinius, that despite their best efforts to keep everything in check, those urges to just open people up like Capri Suns are still there. And there's there's nothing they can do to ever really make it stop, which would continue to haunt them. This would get stressed more and more as they entered the next stage of the galaxy, known as the Horus Heresy. It comes up in literally every video. Everything Imperium related, I, I promise you will. Do not think about it too much. It's just... One of those Thanksgiving dinners where somebody brought up politics and now we're all shouting for some reason. Now half the family's on one side and half the family's on the other side and like the dog is scared but somebody tossed him like a turkey leg so I guess he's kind of happy. I don't know. That's that's the heresy. Uh, the Blood Angels spent a lot of time during the heresy just going from one end of the galaxy to the other fighting constantly. And the whole time they're doing this, Corn is just in the background going, Blood for the blood god. Just the entire time. Corn is trying so desperately to get them to join, but they still hold firm. I mean, it makes sense why Mr. Blood for the Blood God would want the vampires. And if you think about the Revenant days, it really makes sense. That stuff Corn loves. <laughs> I'll let you eat people again. Yeah, it's it's a match made in hell, but they they held firm, helping establish a second Imperium for the few minutes there that everyone thought the Emperor had died because it, war makes things murky. That's just how it goes. Especially war on that scale. Mm -hmm. And then, when they found out that Dad wasn't dead, they led the charge right back to Earth to reinforce it, and they went so far as to board the ship for the closing act of the heresy. They were one of the few legions to be on board with on that ship for the final fight, unless it gets rewritten in one of the new books because it keeps getting rewritten for some reason i don't know why but this is where that second problem arises because before the emperor fights horus sanguinius finds when they teleported sanguinius found horus first and he's not gonna run away so he went and fought him which did not end well it did not end well he Horus beat the feathers off of Sanguinius and left him with one of the most unflattering pieces of 40k art out there. You know the one. He rebroke his legs. Yeah. yeah. I, it's actually one of my favorite things about Sanguinius is every bit of text describes him as being this angelic and just divine looking figure that is beyond comprehension as to how sculpted they look almost. And then you see a lot of his older art, and you wonder where that went. Because half of it has him looking like a Habsburg, and the other half is him laid out on the stairs. So he's the getting... Crimson chin. He, crimson chin. Yeah, he's, he's getting better art nowadays in, 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 in fan art and in some of the other books. They have him drawn really well, but for a minute there, they had him looking like a Habsburg, and... Does not, the crimson chin. It was, it was pretty rough. Literally the crimson chin. This death was something Sanguinius knew would happen, though. He, he, he'd, he, 
he had the ability to see into the future slightly. Um, and he wasn't the only one of his brothers, too. He was just the most well-adjusted to get that ability. And he knew that his final death would be right here, right now, with Horus on board the ship. It was something he was so confident in. A lot of the time, the reason there's so many pieces of art of Sanguinius making a final stand is he would rush into these unwinnable fights with the battle cry of, this isn't my place to die. And you're left with one of two options there. Well, if it's not his place to die, and Who's he's charging it? at me with a sword, well, is this mine? Well, one plus one is two. Mm-hmm. And and so this is something Sanguinius knew, and he had he full bore could have ran, but he he chose to face his death, like he had seen it, and sacrificed himself to kind of create a chink in Horus's armor that the Emperor could exploit later. However, when he passed. Or rather, okay, I'm trying really hard because, again, every one of these episodes, I'm the state-mandated hype man for, for the faction. But there's no flattering way to put this. Horus beat him so badly, it traumatized all of his kids from that point forwards. He created a psychic wound across an entire legion that causes them to enter the state known as the Black Rage. And it's... Simply put, like, the Red Thirst prestiged. It's, it's, it's a leveled up version of the Red Thirst. Instead of becoming raging barbarians like they used to be in the Revenant days, instead everything goes dark, and suddenly, that's Horus. That's Horus. That's Horus. That every, every single enemy you see on the battlefield is the arch traitor Horus, and you are Sanguinius making his last stand. Everything I see is Horus. Yeah, it's it's... It's a mass. Every, everything reminds me of him. <laughs> it's it's a massive con because your your mind is gone. There's even though the Blood Angels have a, a a lot, a lot of named characters. Only a single digit number of them have made it back from the Black Rage. This isn't like the Red Thirst. It's a, basically a death sentence. When you succumb to the Black Rage, you become this uncontrollable storm. That is only useful in the battlefield, and that is it. You are fighting with the fury of your dead father, but trapped in the body of a regular space marine. However, that's kind of a pro, too. Because that's a space marine fighting with the fury of Sanguinius. It's... When they're put out on the battlefield, it's a problem. That's a very massive problem. Yes, they, this is the most dangerous a Blood Angel could be. I mean, the, the, the Red Thirst is cool and all, but they're fighting like they're Sanguinius. It's a different caliber. And this reckless abandon usually lets them win the day at the cost of their own lives, which leads to the point, which is why they put out their an honorable death. However, sometimes they win, and if that's the case, one of two things will happen. First, they'll either be carefully, and I mean carefully, transported back into that same tower I mentioned earlier, and then contained until the next major fight happens where they're needed. Or, they get ceremoniously executed by one of the coolest blood angels out there, Astaroth the Grim. That's a name right there. Oh, he's so cool. Oh, oh, he's he's got the phenomenal aesthetic of being this dark angelic executioner who whose fighting purpose is to treat the brothers suffering from the black rage with honor and dignity not because they're gonna win this fight because oh yeah they're gonna win this fight but because someday we may suffer their same fate and that's what drives him to do what he does he's kind of unsettling to a lot of blood angels because my head could wind up at the receiving end of that axe one day. And he has this uncanny sense for detecting when um, a brother's about to, or a bunch of brothers are about to fall to the Black Rage. So he will always be nearby. But this has led people to thinking he's causing it at times. Mm -hmm. Because you can only be around so many house fires before we think you're an arsonist. But at the end of the day, he's a really, really good guy, despite having a job so grim it's in his name he's really cool i quite like it and he's got a pretty neat model too um but today that 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 catches us up to today which is 
where they spend all their time suffering. Mm. That's that's pretty much from day like you wake up, suffer, go to bed. That's a blood angel's day. But they don't just suffer in the typical 40k way of everything sucks, but we persevere in spite of it. And it's not even just the suffering from dealing with those two massive genetic flaws that they have to cope with every single day. But rather they suffer from having shoes that are borderline unfillable that they have to deal with. Sanguinius could effectively do no wrong. And he was one of the most beloved of the Emperor's sons. He was grace incarnate, and even though many space marines and their fathers perished during the heresy, none have been mourned to the level of Sanguinius by the not just the blood angels, but the common man. Shrines have been built in his honor to this day, side by side with those ones for the emperor, and some people even worship Sangi above the emperor as their savior, because we wouldn't have an emperor if he did not sacrifice himself. It's that level of love. He's the one who died so that we could continue to live. He even has an entire holiday, which is 40K's version of Easter, just to commemorate his sacrifice. Are you getting the allegory here yet? (laughs) There are statues of him on countless worlds, some that him and his sons have never even set foot on, but they still worship him. And to this day, that place where he landed became a mecca of sorts, with everyone going there to see the angels fall. He's not perfect, don't get me wrong, but damn. Was he close? Yeah, if there was ever anybody close, and... It's so bad. This isn't just something that the the blood angels are hyping in their own heads or the common man's hyping in their own heads. At its worst, during the heresy, Horus spent a suspicious amount of time just trying to kill Sanguinius. Enough for people to start wondering, is he just a threat? Or are you worried that Korin's going to get him and then all the other chaos gods are going to jump ship? Because that was a possibility. Of just him getting Sanguinius, and they're just like, okay, Horus, we're done with you. Yeah, that's a much better champion. It, he was that guy. Chaos was constantly trying to turn him, and he held firm. And when the Emperor was assumed dead, the first person everyone looked at was Sanguinius. He was that guy. There's a lot of people who are fighting for that title in 40k, but Sanguinius is so close. And that's the bar that the Blood Angels crush themselves trying to reach every single day. Compared to all the stuff that he did, it kind of doesn't matter that one of the longest living space marines out there is a Blood Angel, or the fact that they are one of the few planets to have ever looked a Tyranid fleet in the eye and They didn't win, but they didn't lose, which is far more impressive. Because for the Blood Angels, every single day is spent in this continuous struggle to try and match Sanguinius' energy, all while also trying to tamp down the violent urge to treat people like glow sticks. Every single day. This is a universe where everything sucks, and they also have all this to deal with, too. You can see why they're always drawn pretty dang sad and it's why i've grown to like them so much in researching this episode they are probably more than any legion the epitome of continued struggle they will wake up day in and day out constantly just trying to be a little bit better than yesterday despite being rigged from the start the deck was never in their favor other than being hot that's it Everything else was stacked against them. They are the best example in 40k of making sure each hammer swing is better than the last. Just focusing on improvement each and every day until eventually, thousands of years from now, they'll wake up and realize they're old men. That's what they live for. And it's really touching. I I really like that sentiment. Um, And I, I fully get why people gravitate towards them for that peace that's at their heart now the other reason people gravitate towards them aesthetics it's their hobby they're going to be one of the cooler looking legions they have jump packs all over the place to emulate the aerial grace of sanguinius in combat they are heavily themed after gothic vampires i'm talking like hard 
Team Edward. They're basically just vampires. Yeah, they have lots of gold, lots of red. They have basically a monopoly on those colors in the Imperium. They they even have these masks called... Uh, the, they have these masks that they put on that will emulate the death visage of the previous wearer so well that it will strike fear into those who look at it. And one of the best ones out there is worn by Dante, who has Sanguinius's. It's a perfect match of his death shriek that haunts them to this day. And a lot of the time, people see that and just leave. They don't want to I deal. I don't want to deal with that. Yeah, He's going to win that fight. I don't want to mm-hmm. even try. And on top of all of that, they have so many named characters, chapters, quirks, features that all could have their own episode. I'm not even kidding. Like, there's... Oh, there's I, I'm not going to sit here and list them. There's a lot. There's a lot. Off the top, some of my favorite ones, Mephiston, Dante, Astaroth, they're all really good. But if you look at the list of named uh, Blood Angels and successor chapters, it's giving the Ultramarines a run for their money. It, but it, it's really cool how often they change things up like that. It's pretty neat. But um, those are all episodes for a future date. Maybe even next week we'll cover one of them that's particularly very sad. Almost like they, one, one might say they lament. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. For now, though, it's time for our foreign fracas. Our foreign fracas or international incident. It's a working title. That's the full title. I this come, week's winner. Come back from being sick, hoping that you'd forget. Nope. And this is what happens. I never, never forget. Never, never forget. Go on. <laughs> this week's winner is actually Jamaica. So congr- oh, I've been seeing the flags in the comment. Con- yeah, that makes sense. Congratulations to the biggest island nation in the Caribbean, Jamaica. Um, I have three fun facts for you guys today. Uh, the first one is, um, did you know that Jamaica is home to the most radioactive spa? Why would I go to a radioactive spa? Because I guess there's a local legend that it may or may not have healing properties. So people just like dump cash into going and seeing what happens. To be fair, they do limit you to uh, about 20 minutes every session. And I don't know how long they keep you from going in every session. But yeah. Okay. At least they they know. At least they know it's radioactive. Uh, It's been measured as having about uh, 16 nanocuries per liter of water, which I don't know what kind of measurement that is. And... Asking Google to convert nanocuries to something that somebody might understand, even if you have the technical background to understand, it was a bit difficult. Well, I know for a fact we have nuclear physicists to watch and people who work in reactors, so the answer will be in the comments. It probably will I be in the comments, you that. and we will probably pin it. Mm-hmm. Um, for the second fun fact, uh, Jamaica has the most churches by density in the world. Dang having a record of 2.75 churches for, per square mile. That's a lot. That's like you throw a rock, you hit a church. Most churches by density. I'll give them credit. Okay. Um, this one is actually a pretty well-known fun fact, but I it's love the bobsledding the- team. It's a bobsledding in team. In 1988, Jamaica became the first tropical country ever to enter in Winter Olympics with an entry into bobsledding, which was universally panned by most Jamaicans at the time as what are we doing here? (laughs) We don't even have a bobsled. (laughs) And it became a joke for the next couple years. Yeah. Just like, why are we bobsledding? We don't have a bobsled. Where are we going to train? What? The moment I heard it was well known. I just knew. We can never, they can... uh... Whatever. I, I love the Jamaican bobsledding team. Did they win? Okay, well. <laughs> you know what? I will never, ever, ever give anyone crap for trying something new. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's actually a Disney film about this. I can't remember the name. Cool Runnings. Yep, that one. And the entire message is just like, you know how to do something? Do it anyway. Who knows? You could do very well. If you do real bad, doesn't mm-hmm. matter. You did something new. Yeah, and that is the episode for this week. As always, you know, comment between the four choices that you've been given. That's the only way that uh, episodes get made. And uh, I've been seeing a lot of you leave flags, and I think that's the easiest way to do the fracas. So drop the flags in the comment, too. For those of you wondering where last week's episode was, I was... 
mauled by Nurgle is the easiest way to put it. I'm still recovering, so the energy is so-so, but thank you so much for all of you that have been sending in your well wishes. I deeply appreciate that, and the schedule will be back to normal, baby, twice a week from now till ever. Until he gets sick again. No, I, I now have a plan for that. Until I get sick again. Okay, I don't have a plan for that. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. And as always, thank you for being you.